Okay, I think we get started. I need to use the microphone for colleagues online uh, to, uh, to hear us. Before kicking off this discussion, I just want to double check if colleagues online can hear us. Hear you, thank you very much. Sounds good. Okay, thanks a lot. Good morning, everyone. Uh, we're very glad uh, to host uh, uh, this event with uh, Professor uh, Kaling uh, on Ethiopia's Durable Solutions Initiative, which was endorsed by the Ethiopian federal authorities not so long ago. We can count them, I guess, in, in days. We're very fortunate to have Professor Kalin here to explain this uh, exciting development to us. I think there is a lot of breakthroughs, both in terms of policy, but also from engagement from partners and, and donor com community. Uh, Professor Kalin, among uh, many things he's currently committing to or committed to, uh, is the special advisor for the resident and humanitarian coordinator in Ethiopia. And as part of this role, uh, has, you have played a, a key role in el elaborating this initiative. Uh, from our side in the GPC, we see the strong linkages between durable solutions initiatives uh, in general, the GP20, as well as centrality of protection. We definitely see that solutions are the fulfillment uh, uh, of, uh, of protection. And maybe to kick off uh, this discussion uh, before handing over to, uh, to Professor uh, Kalen and then uh, having a round of, I guess, dynamic uh, interaction with you to, to dig deeper in, into this initiative. I wanted to share a short story uh, that to me highlights the importance of, uh, of human dignity uh, as a principle of, uh, of protection whenever we're seeking uh, solutions. Uh, there is a great uh, doctor, a uh, Swedish doctor called uh, Hans Rosling, uh, some of you might know he has been very adventurous in, in showing the statistics on, on development and, and humanitarian issues. And in the 90s, he was working in, uh, in Mozambique, and he had a small clinic that was covering uh, half a million population. And he had staff of two uh, as the only health facility covering this population. And a couple of days a week, he would take the car and go to, to villages that cannot uh, that are far away where people cannot walk long enough to the, uh, to the clinic. One day he arrived to a village where people were calling him the tall doctor, Dr. Tall. Uh, and if some of you have seen the TED Talks or met Dr. Rusling, who uh, is no longer with us, uh, he is not a very tall guy. So he asked them, why are you calling me Dr. Tall? And he said, because they said, or the chief of the village said, because we respect you so much. And he said, but I've never been to this village. Why do you respect me so much? He said, well, because you have treated a, a lady that came from our village in your, in your health clinic. And he said, oh, great. Uh, can I meet her? And they said, no, sorry. She died while you were operating her. And then Hans was getting a bit nervous and he said, I'm so sorry to hear that. I, I cannot recall this incident. And they started telling him the complications that she had. And he remembered the story. And he said, but I failed as a doctor. Why do you still respect me? And he said, it's because of what happened after that. After that, you have actually used the only ambulance car that you have to bring the body back to the village in a proper wrapped cloth. And we have never been respected as such in our life, let alone when we pass away. And this is why we respect you so much. And I'll pause a bit because to let this concept sink in, in all our processes of development, nexus, solutions, uh, durable solutions, keeping this, the anchor on, on a human dignity at the, at the center of it is so crucial, I think, for all of us. And that makes things go durable. Uh, in, in many senses, and, and populations accept uh, support that we bring. So I wanted to kick off a bit with this, uh, with this story uh, and hand over to Professor Kalen to tell us about the work in Ethiopia. Uh, so over to you. Thank you so much, William, for uh, opening with such a beautiful story. Yes, in fact, Solutions is about um, 
giving dignity back to people who have lost uh, everything, helping them to rebuild uh, their lives. And that's also what the, um, the Europe Solutions Initiative in Ethiopia is about. Uh, next, please. So, um, in the first part of my presentation, I um, will say a few things about what the Europe Solutions Initiative is about, how we conceptualized it. In the second part, then I will um, look at um, the more practical work being done now and in the coming months in the uh, Somali region of um, Ethiopia. Next. The, um, the Global Solutions uh, Initiative in Ethiopia really builds up on the model of um, the DSI in uh, Somalia, where uh, we started uh, back in 2016. The idea really there was uh, to um, build a nexus between uh, development humanitarian actors, work together with um, the uh, government, and all of that uh, on the UN side um, being kind of um, supported by uh, the Herbal Solutions Unit within the RCO. And this model was replicated uh, now in Ethiopia. Um, what um, we um, achieved this far was agreement among the UN actors and with the government on a um, DSI concept uh, note or paper. It's available to you if you're interested in and uh, this sets out what the DSI is about. Uh, it's uh, not a program. It's a principled operational framework, as we say, kind of building consensus, expressing that consensus on the notion of durable solutions, the understanding of it. And that's very important in the context of Ethiopia, where we know earlier this year, first half of this year, uh, many people, many IDPs were brought back to their place of origin, sometimes voluntarily, sometimes less voluntarily. And at highest levels, uh, there were messages of like, well, the problem is solved, they are back. Uh, the good thing is that the government agrees that durable solutions are only achieved if uh, returns, uh, local integration or resettlement, uh, relocation are sustainable and uh, IDPs no longer have needs uh, that are linked to their having been uh, displaced. Uh, it's also about uh, some common programming principles we agreed on and then um, also the levels of actions and the approaches. So it's a platform a platform to facilitate collective action, to bring uh, the different actors uh, together. And of course, it's based on uh, the uh, relevant uh, international standards. Next, please. Who is involved? Yes, uh, the government of Ethiopia at different levels, very much uh, right now the federal level. And I will come back to who at the federal level, because this is one of um, the um, problems we still have to look at. Then, of course, the United Nations, um, INGOs, um, donors. We have, I must say, a lot of traction at uh, government levels, at the federal level, and then also, uh, particularly in the Somali region, by the uh, Somali regional government. Um, I also have met uh, the uh, president, vice president of Oromia, who also um, said that they are um, support in, in support of it, but they are a bit less advanced in terms of uh, really action. And other of the federal reg uh, regional states remains to be seen. We have a uh, durable solutions working group at the federal level. And here I'm coming to, as I said, uh, the little bit of problem we have. This is chaired by the National Disaster Risk Management Commission, that's NDR. MC, National Disaster Risk Management Commission, which is really a body to um, provide from the government side um, humanitarian uh, assistance in the aftermath of um, disasters, not only those linked to natural uh, hazards, but also disasters in the sense of conflict. 
And uh, the problem is that, um, of course, you need a whole of government approach. You would need to have all the line ministries on board to really uh, achieve durable uh, solutions. And um, that's one of the um, things we are looking at. Then at the UN level, there is a uh, UN team on durable solutions, which is established under the federal level durable solutions working group. And then uh, the durable solutions coordinator and uh, a little bit of support uh, staff um, being built up in the uh, office of the resident uh, coordinator. And my role is to support that as a special advisor to the RC, HC. Next. So what is the idea to work on which levels? The first level is policy. And it's about mainstreaming durable solutions uh, into a uh, key uh, uh, strategies, uh, policies, here very much mainstreaming it into development planning. This is a lesson learned from Somalia. When we got it into their national development plan, it was much, much easier to get the development actors on board. It was much easier to access uh, also development funding because, I mean, the national development plan, that's really the vision of the government and the international community uh, supporting it. So this is an instrument to get it into that, uh, those plans uh, to um, build uh, the nexus. And in my view, it's one of the most efficient, not the only one, but one of the most efficient instruments to build the nexus. Then we're talking about the legislative level. Uh, the government uh, has announced that it is um, ready to uh, ratify or envisaging, of course, you have to go through all the proceedings, uh, to ratify the Kampala Convention on IDPs. And as you know, the Kampala Convention requires implementing uh, legislation to domesticate it. Uh, UNHCR is leading that process. Uh, my colleague, um, Professor Chaluka Bejani, is working on that. We're closely coordinating, particularly on those parts of the law that deal with durable solutions and institutional setups. The uh, institutional level is very much about um, first, um, strengthening, as you can see here, uh, coordination. We uh, do have, as I said, the uh, Federal Durable Solutions Working Group. We have a uh, Durable Solutions Working Group uh, at the Somali, in the Somali region, and other regions either have already started or will start to build up those uh, Durable Solutions Working Groups that um, are, again, government and um, the international uh, community. But then it's also very much about enhancing a whole of government approach. And I'll come back uh, a bit later uh, on how to, to do that. Um, planning is important, planning in the sense of spatial planning, urban planning, uh, because um, we do have a urbanization trend also in uh, Ethiopia, maybe a bit less fast and acute uh, compared to other countries in the region. Somalia is much, much faster urbanizing, but still. And uh, some of the cities of the towns are looking at uh, city expansion, and if you can get uh, uh, durable solutions into those plans, of course, um, we uh, would have a long-term perspective that is very important. And then, of course, the um, operational level. Next, please, where I can explain it a little bit. So, what are the ideas right now? What are the colleagues in uh, Ethiopia working on? First, the more long-term perspective, the systemic issues, as I had said, uh, to get it into um, the uh, development uh, planning. We have an opportunity. Uh, Ethiopia right now is preparing what they call a 10-year prospective plan. And then based on that, um, uh, the next is the third five-year growth and transformation plan which is really the National Development Plan. It's very uh, much oriented towards uh, macroeconomic trends. Uh, the idea is to create an environment that is conducive for uh, investments. But it has, it has eight pillars, but some of the pillars are really uh, interesting and relevant for us. Agriculture, for instance, and there's also human development as a separate pillar that is important, uh, and some of the other pillars. And very first discussions have been taking place. A colleague from um, 
Nairobi, and I Fedobri from Habitat, uh, was, uh, had meetings with the National Planning Commission, not as Habitat person, but with the RCO hat on. And um, it looks like uh, there are some um, chances to get it into those plans, but it requires work because, um, of course, um, those also within the UN system dealing with the national plan, they, they don't know much about internal displacement. So we are bringing together uh, the durable solutions team with the counterparts who are involved in the planning process. Uh, also, there uh, are um, right now uh, work being done uh, to, to work sector-wise with uh, the health, uh, with the education, etc. I already mentioned that, uh, and then, of course, on the um, UN side, um, the thing formerly known as UNDAF, now UNSDCF, <laughs> the UN Sustainable Development Cooperation Framework. And again, it has to be there. And I think uh, colleagues also will start uh, to work to get it into um, the uh, co new cooperation framework. So it's the right time to do it. And it's great that we have uh, these possibilities. Uh, law, I already mentioned, Kampala Convention, the law. At the institutional level, what we have seen, um, for instance, in the context of return, it's, it's just anecdotal, but in a way it really illustrates what I mean. I've been um, uh, visiting um, returnees in areas um, along the border between the Somalia and the Oromia region that were literally just sitting under trees. Uh, in the middle of the rainy season, it still would have been possible to, to plant, uh, but there was nothing, no tools, no seeds, uh, and they, where we were, they need to plow. And then you saw the tractors just next door, where you had more commercial farming. Nobody's thinking about how to link them up, how to have these tractors hired, some vouchers, etc. Something they did, for instance, um, in Kenya, when they closed the IDB camps 2008-09 um, after the post-election crisis, where the Ministry of uh, Agriculture was on board and really helped the returnees with plowing, basically, and seeds and tools. Here, of course, yeah, the Ministry of uh, Agriculture has nothing to do with IDPs. So it is important to start to engage with uh, these um, uh, ministries, the line ministries, and again, we have a good institutional entry point under the, um, uh, the so-called DAG, the Development Assistance Group, that's the development donors. They have set up these sectoral working groups, bringing together donors, agencies, and the line ministries. So it's one on health, on education, on agriculture, and so on. And no agriculture, not yet, but uh, many of the other relevant sectors. And uh, the government has asked uh, the uh, colleagues in Ethiopia now to engage with these sectoral working groups. We had a first meeting uh, on health when I was there, and the immediate outcome was that the um, Minister of Health uh, asked um, my colleague, uh, El Natrafi, the uh, Durable Solutions Coordinator, to come to the Minister of Health and brief all the directors on the Durable Solutions Initiative. I mean, that's really kind of encouraging. Uh, then, as I said, the whole of government approach to me, the entry point is to get it into the law. All these laws have some institutional mechanism. The old laws, uh, like uh, with the refugee uh, laws, uh, delegated to some um, uh, commission or committee, uh, which and again means it's siloed. Um, more recent approaches, like in Somalia, really try to um, uh, have a whole of government approach. In Somalia, for instance, uh, what they set up is the Durable Solutions Secretariat in the Ministry of Planning. And it's not a secretariat in the sense of computers and desks. It's where all the relevant parts of the government are coming together. And if you could do something, it will not be exactly the same thing because you have different uh, administrative setups. But if you could get something into the law that doesn't silo it, that doesn't delegate it, that goes beyond just uh, the humanitarian response, then again, we have a good entry point. So this is very much about entry points. Mm, nothing has been achieved, everything is new, but the entry points are there. Next, please. At the level of programming, we have 
uh, developed what we call a toolbox, uh, different programming tools. Again, if you're looking at what uh, needs to be done to achieve durable solutions, you're familiar with the durable solutions uh, framework, so all the different eight elements uh, in the region, uh, the regional um, durable solutions uh, secretariat, RETS, which is uh, brings together uh, INGOs, has simplified it a little bit. What we need is uh, physical safety. What we need is material safety. That's about housing services, etc., livelihoods, and then also legal safety. That's documentation, uh, uh, transitional justice, and these kind of, of things. And um, to achieve that now at an operational level, uh, we uh, are the uh, concept note distinguishes between three categories of approaches. The first one is really area-based interventions, not beneficiaries, but area-based. That's a concept of displacement affected communities. And you see that very clearly. We had a meeting um, with a local community hosting one of the biggest uh, IDP camps in the Somali region, um, Kolochi camp. And the local community, for instance, told us that some of their people had been displaced by the arrival of the IDPs. So, in another uh, relocation site, the local authorities told us, um, yeah, we have uh, one, uh, uh, 380 families arriving who will be relocated. Now we have a big problem uh, with our health post because we get yearly assignments of tracks of medicines and they are already depleted because this was based, calculated on the basis of the previous population. So that's why it is area-based. What is also very important uh, in this uh, Ethiopian context is really a risk analysis. There are areas where you can't go for durable solutions. Could you get your, certainly not, uh, and even in the Somali region, um, and the authorities, uh, when we were there last week, are very open about it. There are areas which are still too volatile. So one has to do a risk analysis to look at how far is the re reconciliation advanced, how durable will it be. Uh, what is very important is community-based planning. That's again a lesson from Somalia that um, if you really want to have ownership and again from a peace building perspective, bringing communities together, it has to be community-based planning. They have to decide on what are their priorities, what they really need. Of course, it's about providing basic services and very important livelihoods. It's very much about livelihoods. And we know we are all very weak on livelihoods, particularly when it's about sustainable livelihoods and not short-term interventions. And the second approach is uh, helping um, IDPs at the household level, individualized solutions. Many of the IDPs uh, are uh, traders, small business people. Um, for them, it's about micro grants, micro credits. Uh, in the rural areas, again, micro grants, micro credits to build up small cooperatives when people uh, go back or are uh, relocated, uh, facilitating access to livelihoods. But all of that will be limited. I mean, we're talking about very large numbers. I will present you the numbers uh, for just the Somali region in a moment. We never will have the resources uh, to achieve durable solutions uh, to a substantial extent with um, a projectized approach. And that's why it is so important to integrate solutions into ongoing and planned programs on the government side, on the international side. Uh, WH. There's a lot of money in Ethiopia uh, from the development side. And there are large programs. Uh, WHO, for instance, has now a new program, uh, Health for Peace, that looks at health, but from a peace building perspective. There are the resilience programs. And if all these programs that are active in areas where there are IDPs, returnees, displacement affected communities, if all these programs systematically would integrate solutions into um, their programming, then we would have the kind of scale that is uh, needed. This is what I call a solutions marker, like the gender marker, if the development actors, the line ministries systematically would ask, are we operating in areas with displacement affected communities? Are we covering them? 
If not, do we have good reasons or not? If not, are we still addressing the specific needs of uh, displacement affected communities, which might be different from communities that have not been affected by displacement, then we really would go um, a long way. Next, please. Okay, uh, maybe I should interrupt here and uh, if you have any questions on the DSI in general before I will move on to the Somali region. Let's see, yes. Perhaps just one on the history. How difficult was it to get there? Um, because yeah, it's a model that you're following and improving yeah. from Somalia, but obviously uh, Ethiopia would have its own challenges. How yeah. Uh, first, um, it's not copy-pasting Somalia. It's kind of the idea of a country-based Europe Solutions initiative as a platform uh, under the um, uh, uh, RCO with a unit housed in, in, in the RC, uh, under the RC with a unit house in, in uh, the RCO and then trying to build the nexus. It's at that abstract level. The rest uh, is uh, different. Uh, it was, uh, on the one hand, um, it took less time than in uh, Somalia. There it was really about over several years because we could build on that experience. Uh, there was also a lot of exchange of knowledge experiences. This was very helpful. Uh, it was um, in a way easier and more difficult at the same time, looking at the uh, history of uh, the discussions about the forced returns, uh, where um, some donors uh, were very, very reluctant to engage, even on this discussion on durable solutions saying, well, this is just playing into the hands of the government and it's a fig leaf. Um, and it took some time to, to overcome that, but um, this was now, I would say, a few months for the Somali region, because now um, I think everyone accepts that there are real opportunities. And with that we, the fact that in other parts of Ethiopia it's still difficult, we should not wait but we should um, use those opportunities. Uh, so in that sense, it was, I think, sunk easier. Um, I also felt uh, that um, it was quite, it was very positive in Somalia to see that some of the development agencies, particularly Habitat and FAO, but also UNICEF, very early on were, were on board. And in Somalia, it took some time to get these guys on board. Uh, I mean, it was still perceived very much as, yeah, that's, let's leave it to the uh, humanitarians. I've got Sumbul first and then uh, David and colleagues online, if you want to speak up, please type in uh, or flag it so we, uh, we get it to you. So Sumbul, then, then David. Okay, no, thank you very much. This is extremely useful and thank you for the call before we get to the um, And you already highlighted two key elements of your so, do you mind speaking on the phone for people? Sorry, online? sorry, sorry about that. I, sitting so close, I thought I could just. It doesn't want me to speak. Okay, so risk analysis is very important, and thank you for pointing that out. And you named Gujigedo, and there are several other regions as well uh, in that context. Um, and you also mentioned that for the Somali region, some of the skeptics on, uh, for obvious reasons on, on, on the voluntariness aspect of the situation had come around. Uh, what would you advise as the way forward in the more contentious areas for the humanitarian community? There are so many actors here uh, because most obviously, and this is well acknowledged now that we should not have to wait for situations change. The fact is, how do we best impact people who are in need? Thank you. My, I have three questions. My first one is the same as Sumbul's. I'm actually quite pessimistic about the future of Ethiopia. Um, I'm worried about the Aroma region. I'm worried that a leader has emerged from the Aroma people who is directly challenging the prime minister. I'm worried that 70 people were killed in 48 hours after the prime minister won um, the Nobel Peace Prize. So is it the correct moment to be investing in durable solutions in the Somali region where maybe we need to do prevention activities in other parts of the country and in particular the Aroma region? Um, number two relates to leadership of the durable solutions initiative. 
where is UNHCR in this? Because it is my understanding that that initiative is being led by IOM in the Somali region, and how do you see UNHCR positioned? Number three relates to the Kampala Convention. And while the federal state may talk about ratification, it's actually the regional states that have their own very strong regional law where we may need to see ratification also happen. So my question to you is, and maybe this is more of a question of, of law, but if Ethiopia ratifies and if incorporation is then made into federal law, but incorporation is not made into regional law, is ratification actually effective? Thanks. Lots of questions. Um, let me start with the last one. Uh, of course, uh, the um, regional states cannot ratify an instrument, international instrument. That's um, international law. It's, it's Ethiopia as a nation state. Um, second, it's very clear that um, domestication just at the federal level is not good enough. Uh, it has to be followed by, um, or even done in parallel by uh, the regions. And again, we will have very different uh, dynamics at, at, at uh, those uh, levels. Uh, leadership varies UNHCR. UNHCR uh, traditionally didn't really engage in Ethiopia on IDP issues because UNHCR work there is really on refugees. But uh, the position has changed. We had uh, the uh, mission, um, Zumbul was there, Liz was there. And uh, I think uh, that um, this really has brought a change. Uh, my discussions with UNHCR were really very encouraging. And um, IOM was very much in the lead, but there is an agreement between the two, surprise, surprise, that, um, for instance, um, now in the uh, Oromia region where a durable solutions working group will be um, established, it will be a co-lead. And uh, in terms of then um, the operations, the areas, it's simply then a question of where, who goes where, because <laughs> It's so vast and so much to do. There's more than enough space for everyone. And I really felt a very positive dynamic, I must say. So I'm, I'm very, very happy about uh, that. Um, worries um, in, uh, about um, the uh, future of Ethiopia? Yes, everyone shares those worries. At the same time, simply to say we are waiting, and then we have to catch up then we are contributing to the protractedness of the uh, internal displacement. So all the work at policy level makes a lot of sense. And again, it might be undone. We don't know that. We might be lucky and it will be uh, more limited to the difficulties. They will be able to manage it. But um, because this is a long term, this is not about just the present caseload. It, there will be new displacements. And we would hope that if there is a new crisis, uh, the um, a government would be uh, better to, to uh, would be um, in a position to handle it in a, in a better way. So this makes sense. At project levels, um, yes, there is a dilemma. The way I see it is to invest into durable solutions, for instance, in um, areas of return where you have a conducive environment, is preventive action. Because if you have these communities just sitting under trees and getting handouts once and then, then it's about, again, survival with very limited resources. And then it doesn't take much and we'll have a wave of violence at that level. So to me, this is about a contribution to peace building, at least at that level. And then there are areas like uh, the relocations in the Somali regions, far away from the conflict zones. Even if there will be bad things, ha would, uh, bad things happening, they would be much less affected. And there, again, it makes a lot of sense. So it's really the risk analysis. And then we know how long it takes to get all these things taking off, to have the donors on board. So the message to say, because of all these risks, um, it's... Um, it, 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 it's a problem, we shouldn't start now, really it's the wrong message. Um, sorry, your, your question. Well, mine was sort of related, but it was more about what would be the way forward. Ah, yeah, exactly, yes, in the difficult regions, yes, sorry. Um, again, 
there are area, I see kind of three categories of areas now, area-based, those where it's really just humanitarian action. Uh, but even there, one can, should think of like building a more long-term perspective into um, the humanitarian response. How can we shape it so in a way that it is contributing to building resilience to some limited extent, or is it just the next six months without anything beyond that? And this can be done. Then uh, there are areas kind of for your quick impact projects, early recovery type, but again, starting to build up the relationships with the government to build the capacities, the understanding. If you're looking at the uh, Velegas, for instance, where it's still very volatile, um, uh, particularly West Velega and Kamashi zone, East Velega, Kamashi zone is a bit better. But there, for instance, we have this um, bilateral um, Peace and Development Bureau, which is government, and they report to the regional presidents directly, and they now want to in include Gambela into that. So we have a government structure that looks exactly at solutions, and uh, to work together with them, again, in a long-term perspective, makes a lot of sense. If it's just waiting till it's stable, and then so to me, it's all looking at it as a process and looking at the identifying windows of opportunity, doing exactly that kind of analysis, what makes sense here, what does not make sense there. Thanks. Any other question online? Let me turn to, to the colleagues listening in. Do we have any questions at this, uh, at this stage? Okay. So maybe we can but I have a question, uh, you tell me whether it's the right time, on uh, donor interest and especially development and nexus related interested donor interest, especially for the, con the complicated contexts. Now I'll come back to that. So let's look at the uh, Somali region. Uh, next, please. So <clears throat> lots of red dots which are the one, uh, 401 IDP sites uh, along the border here on uh, the left. That's the border to uh, the uh, Oromia region. That's conflict. Those more in the interior, that's mainly drought. Uh, we're talking about um, something like 800,000 plus IDPs, 60% uh, conflict, 40% drought. And we should look at both. That's also from the gov not everyone in the government, but at the Somali region level, very much at the perspective also of the government. Next. It's rather complicated because we have different categories. We have uh, Somali, ethnic Somali IDPs who were displaced within the Somali region. That's the people who were living along the border, have been displaced. Many of those, as I said, had already returned. Then we have IDPs of Somali origin who came from um, the interior of the Oromia region, sometimes 400 kilometers away, uh, 600 kilometers away from the uh, Oromia uh, Somali uh, border. And these people don't want to go back. Most of them refuse to go back. Then we have uh, the drought IDPs. Most of these um, IDPs, um, it's kind of short distance displacement. Well, you know, pastoralists are moving around, but of course they belong to a community. And that's the community within Voreda, which is kind of the equivalent of, of a municip big municipality. And um, when they drop out of their pastoralist lifestyle, they settle there. Uh, but then sometimes they cross Voreda borders, but it's not long distance. Next. If you're looking where IDPs are right now, some are still in camps and sites. Uh, that's mainly the IDPs uh, from Oromia, but then also drought IDPs. Then you have IDPs um, in the areas of return. 
some back home, some simply in the area of origin. Uh, that's along the border to Aramia. And then we have IDPs um, already in uh, areas of relocation. That's those from Aramia who don't have to go back. The plan is to resettle them to areas of their subclans. You don't find much about local integration here. Um, the question is what means local integration first? If you have um, these sites somewhere more or less in the middle of nowhere, of course you could build towns there. Uh, we don't have that many IDPs in urban uh, centres, so that's one of the big differences compared to Somalia, for instance, where it's mainly urban IDPs. But I will come back to that in a moment. Next. Uh, this already indicates that we have multiple challenges and different groups that require different responses. In areas of return, the government uh, really started to um, facilitate intercommunity peace processes. That's mainly at the level of elders, and it has not gone down to kind of the grassroots level. When you're asking, for instance, women, are you involved? Do you have contact with women from the other? community and before they had that because it was the same uh, water point where they got their water for instance is nothing or very little again it depends on the location you see uh, very different uh, uh, um, situations uh, there is security in several areas in the sense that people feel that the last um, IOM uh, DT, DTM um, the uh, displacement tracking matrix uh, indicated uh, that many of the returnees now feel reasonably safe. Not all of them. There are, uh, uh, there are volatile uh, situations. Tuli Gullet, for instance, is one, for those who are familiar with the region, is, is a tricky uh, place. Uh, because they were brought back and um, without much preparation, with not much humanitarian assistance following them at the beginning. Some of it now has been reoriented. Uh, it's still emergency needs. Uh, lack of services. I mentioned lack of early agricultural inputs. So in a way, they are really very much still in an IDP-like uh, situation. Next. But in a way, if the situation is stable, if the reconciliation, the peace building works, then that's relatively easy. It's about money, it's about repairing schools, shelters, etc. The real trick issue are the relocations. Uh, the government has started to relocate some. This is one of the relocation sites we have visited in um, Cholai, Magaloat. And I mean, it doesn't really look like relocation, it looks like an IDP site. And in fact, yes, humanitarian needs. Again, humanitarian uh, responses did not really follow these people. Housing needs, lack of livelihoods, land, water, HLP-related challenges. And then it, these relocation sites in, are in rural areas, and many of the IDPs are coming from urban backgrounds, traders, small business people. And of course, for them to find livelihood opportunities is uh, difficult. I uh, visited last week um, one of the um, relocation areas in Somali region called Colchano. Uh, the idea was uh, to relocate uh, from the Kolochi camp 4,000 families, households. And initially, the local community had said, yes, these are our brothers and sisters, the same subclan. They are welcome. But then they came back when they were starting to think about what it means and uh, said, no, no, 1,000 families. Uh, when we were there, there were 200 families who had been relocated and 180 families who had spontaneously followed. Uh, they were sitting um, in a camp like this, in a site like this, but apart from some food distributions, no humanitarian assistance. It didn't follow them. At the same time, they were not the government is building houses, but they were not involved in cash for work programs. So they were worse off than um, they were before, simply because nobody had been thinking about how to transition. 
Another challenge, uh, the government built uh, 200 houses, very nice houses. A little bit later, you will see a picture. But now, of course, the local community says, well, and what about us? Shouldn't some of the houses go to us? We have very vulnerable people here. The type of houses is townhouse. It's not what the uh, building standard is. I was asking, uh, will these people get, um, uh, what kind of, of, of documents will they get? What kind of tenure property? Oh, we will hand it over as property. Very generous. But people don't have access to livelihoods. They have family having a real expensive house case. And I, the rich guy coming, here are $500. Hmm? The house is worth $5,000. I'm not sure that these people will two years later still be in those houses. So again, nobody has really been thinking about these kind of issues. Um, the burden on the host community, I already mentioned the health post, and that's a systemic issue because allocations are made on the basis of the last census, the regular population, not the de facto population. It doesn't work the way uh, relocations were approached. Next. So, what uh, we were working on uh, the last week um, was very much uh, to look at how to do it better. Because keeping these people simply in camps is not a solution. And um, if you go to these camps, and it's mainly those who are waiting for relocation, quite, quite a difficult uh, atmosphere because people say, we want to be relocated. It's, we want to get out of these camps. We want to rebuild our lives. So what to do? There are different things that are now underway and were agreed last week. Uh, first, um, colleagues are uh, developing uh, relocation guidelines based on international standards um, for the Somali region to be adopted by the uh, regional government. The federal government already indicated interest and to have them also adopted at the um, federal level. Relocation guidelines, of course, in line with international standards, because when you do relocations, protection concerns, protection challenges are simply huge, huge, huge. I just mentioned the HLP issue. Uh, at the institutional level, we felt uh, that things are starting to turn a little bit in circles because the approach didn't work. So the government uh, agreed to uh, the suggestion to um, uh, uh, set up a relocation task force. I will come get back to that. Uh, planning a good entry point, Habitat has been asked to uh, do a Chichiga, that's the capital, the regional capital, city extension plan, and there are IDPs for urban integration, particularly again business people, etc., uh, offers a great chance to do that. And then also the relocation sites clearly need spatial planning. Again, it can't go into all the details. At the operational level, uh, it's important first to get money and then to do it right. So the idea is to develop two project proposals for kind of proof of concept. Next, please. Let's go quickly through these things. So the, these are the houses uh, in that site uh, that are built, one house for a family, two rooms. I mean, it's really good but each piece is $5,000. There's water there linked to a uh, kind of a reservoir, but the reservoir is not linked to a borehole. It's water tracking. <laughs> so how long is this sustainable? Hmm? Anyway, uh, the relocation task force will be um, bringing together all the relevant bureaus at the regional level. The ministers are called bureaus disaster risk management, education, health, etc. Then at the UN, um, one or two uh, INGO uh, representation, maybe even donors, and it will be headed by the vice president. So authority will be there and it's the whole of government approach. They will have to uh, develop a menu of options because just relocations to rural areas, they have identified 22 sites are not really working. So about local integration, 
about urban uh, 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 solutions, about individualized solutions, the whole ambit of, again, in line with um, the uh, concept note of interventions. They will have to do um, technical assessments for all the sites. We had some quick assessments for the sites, but the deep technical assessments, not so much are they suitable, but rather what needs to be done to make them suitable. Hmm? What do we need in terms of investments into water? What kind of approaches to housing, etc.? But then also the risk analysis, a protection analysis, all of that. And then based on that, uh, come up with technical plans for not all the relocation sites, but at least for a few for them where relocations already kind of have uh, started. Next. Proof of concept, it's uh, one project that route. This is an IOM Habitat FAO project. It's about their very much local integration of a community. Um, the key idea is uh, community-based planning. Bring uh, the local communities, the IDPs together, let them decide about what the best solutions for them are. Uh, here, for instance, the idea is they can't go back to traditional uh, pastoralism. But if you can produce during uh, the rainy season um, fodder along the river, the local community can kind of sell that uh, to um, those who are uh, producing meat and milk. More intensive ways of agricultural production, not the extensive production uh, methods, and you link it to urban markets, you can do quite a lot. Conflict areas of return, again, community-based planning. There it's a bit less clear what the um, communities will come up with. But the idea is to have money for two projects, one infrastructure or services, the other for livelihoods. And then for the rest of the priorities, really link them with ongoing programs that are relevant. That's the solutions market integration. You're smiling, Sam. That's very much your approach from Somalia uh, that uh, will be used there. Uh, next. Yeah. Uh, that's already a thank you, but before that, uh, the question, what about donors? Donors indicated when we, um, you know, it was a good coincidence because there was um, a heads of mission um, visit uh, to the Somali region by uh, the uh, humanitarian, uh, humanitarian, humanitarian Resilience Donor Group. But some of these people are double-hatted, also development. And there was really a big interest. And um, several of the donors after the visit came and said, uh, please uh, send us these concept notes we are interested in. Others said, yes, we start, have to start internally to discuss uh, the um, solutions marker idea to integrate. So I feel the money is not yet on the table. But I feel uh, that uh, the attitude really has changed and that there is really interest to engage both uh, from the humanitarian and the development donors. That's really positive. Questions? Do we have time or? Yes, we do. Uh, let's take a couple of questions. I have Sam and online questions. OK, Sam, go ahead. I think my question is, um, well, first of all, it's an astonishing amount of progress. And what took years in Somalia seems to be I mean, being achieved in, in months in Ethiopia. And the government's now bought into the DSI Ethiopia, which is also great. Um, my question, being a bit sort of playing devil's advocate, you know, is there a risk that the government's signing up for this rubber stamping it, but we, the NGOs and the UN, are running a bit too fast? We might leave, leave them behind. Yeah. Um, online questions? I have two questions from the leader. The first one is... You have to speak on that. Ah, sorry. Um, the first question is, how, how do we see the risk that the DSI could become politicized by the federal government, given that internal displacement doesn't reflect well on the government and the positive reforms and government is taking? Uh, between brackets, the PM also announced a few months back that IDB have returned and that the government's plan was successful. There's also a second question. In connection to this, would working with local authorities help to do politicize durable solutions and internal displacement? Uh, and to what extent is this level of government already engaged? Thanks. Uh, We'll, we'll answer these questions and flag it if you have uh, yeah. further questions. 
I mean, all, all the three questions um, are related uh, to politicization and, and risk. Um, first, um, the, um, I, I take the second question first because it's a good entry point. Uh, is this just a fig leaf? The government has said, yes, the problem is solved. There are no IDPs. The really interesting thing is, at the top level, President, Prime Minister, this is the discourse. Just below that level, everyone talks about IDPs. It's absolutely no problem. No one told me the problem is solved. And the reason is because they realize in the meantime that, in fact, yes, there are huge problems in the areas of return. The relocations are difficult. So it's quite a realistic assessment at uh, those levels. And that's the Minister of Peace. And there's a history of Ministry of Peace, of Peace and International Community having rather unpleasant discussions. But uh, there it's really very open and, and, and a good technical solution, uh, technical discussion. But it's not the other point, it's really not the federal level that will implement solutions. It's the regional level. And in that sense, the third question, it's in that sense the local governments. I mean, the regional governments and then below, but that's again very hierarchical. Uh, there's little autonomy for at the zonal level, at the Voreda level, at the Kebele level. And uh, there we have the strong engagement uh, in the Somali region. Of course, we are lucky because the president is former OCHA, and uh, several of uh, his staff are former UN. So it's very easy, again, uh, to communicate. The risk of leaving, moving too fast and, and leaving them behind exactly lies there. Uh, because um, we have those entry points, and the dialogue is, in that sense, easy because we share some common concepts and ideas. And with the whole change, they brought in lots of technocrats, lots of diaspora. We don't know what's behind that level. And that's, again, coming back to the risk for the future. This is just now kind of, yeah, superficial, uh, superficial layer where we can work well. Uh, and there, of course, again, it's about risk analysis. But again, it's not an argument to start all of that because you've seen it's a very ambitious program and we just have started it. It's entry points. That's why insisting what I presented is not the solutions. It's the entry points for solutions, entry points for, for engagement. And certainly, um, Right now, it looks good. Maybe in two months, we will have backlashes. I mean, the usual thing, it's going up and down and down. But at least we have the entry points. And uh, in that sense, um, I, I do think that uh, yeah, we, it provides for good opportunities. And to me, to do nothing is creating protracted displacement. And this is doing harm to people. So. We have to be wise, we have to be careful, but let's use all these entry points. Good. David? Um, <clears throat> I wanted to know if, as part of the Durable Solutions Initiative in the Somali region, um, anyone is looking at the legal aspects of reintegration, and in particular, whether or not the internally displaced persons will have the ability to vote in the general elections that are coming up in May. The reason why I ask this question is, as, as we discussed before, the Durable Solutions Initiative in the Somali region is being steered through IOM, with IOM as an, in a leadership role. You do have the global, the protection cluster in the country, and you have IOM possibly doing, you sorry, UNHCR are possibly doing Durable Solutions activities in the Aroma region, but not in the Somali region. Um, I do think that the elections in May are going to be the flashpoint issue where the country would be at most severe risk. The previous three elections have all been violent. Um, so will IDPs be able to vote and is anyone looking at that issue? Thanks. Mm -hmm. We have another question from Christian. Um, coming back a bit again to the, well, you said that it's an awful lot of work that is ahead of us and it's, it's or for, for those uh, in the field. Um, capacity issues. Uh, who, who is going to do all of that? The, the integration into the, or incorporation into the national development plans, 
the sectoral development plans, I guess there will be regional or there are regional development plans, um, who, is, who is leading and carrying out all that work. And the, the second question uh, is, is linked again to the donors, the sort of the donor coordination, development donors now. Um, is there, you mentioned the, the development assistant group, uh, how strongly are they already on board? How actively are they pursuing it out of their own uh, initiative or drive by now? Or is it still driven by um, people like you and, 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 and your, your, your support team? Um, or, or are they already carrying some of the weight forward? Okay, uh, we are really very early stages. Much of what I said was kind of achieved two weeks ago. So um, in terms of um, really getting the commitment from the development uh, actors uh, and donors will require a lot of work. But we have the entry points. We no longer have the rejection or the total disinterest. And even there are differences between, for instance, on the UN side, different agencies. As I said, Habitat, FAO, really being proactive. Um, I haven't mentioned UNDP, for instance. Not being against it, but not yet uh, really uh, fully uh, on, 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 on board. Um, this uh, link to uh, the issue of uh, capacity. This is effectively, uh, again, a challenge. Of course, uh, the difference between um, Ethiopia and many other countries we are operating is that they do have a functioning bureaucracy. It has its limitations. It needs capacity building. But there are people who are doing things and can do things. Uh, for instance, for the Somali region, um, there is a um, Swiss-funded project to uh, provide additional capacity there uh, on HLP issues, on uh, planning, uh, and, and, and other things. So that's a kind of activities. And we need to get um, uh, particularly the double-hatted UN agencies uh, to, to engage. As I said, WHO is a program, Health for Peace, already has that notion in the title of a rather large program of going beyond kind of traditional uh, health, health policies. And it's those co colleagues who have to take up these uh, things. And that's why it is important to have these dialogues with uh, the sectoral working groups. But that's all long work, as I said, it's less than two weeks ago than uh, uh, it was decided to engage with, with the sectoral working groups. Uh, legal aspects uh, have been largely neglected, HLP issues, etc. as I had mentioned using the example. So uh, this will be very much uh, also a task of the task force of the relocation guidelines to bring in these uh, things. When it comes to elections, uh, DPA has issued kind of instructions to uh, the uh, RC, and IDPs are on that list. That's good. Uh, what is the problem? Um, the problem is not so much, well, the way they do it is uh, before any, uh, every election, uh, they go around at the lowest level, the Cabele level, and register all those who are eligible um, as, as voters. Again, that's fine. And in areas of returns, I mean, that's a people, so this will happen. In areas of relocations, if the clan feels strongly we need more voting power, they have an interest to make sure that they will be riches. That's not a problem. The big problem is that you need an ID card. So it's linked to, um, to, to identification. And this needs to be addressed, and I mean, that's very much UNHCR. You are very strong on that. Uh, and unless this is being done, then many IDPs might not be able to vote. Uh, again, that's the Somali region. And then you have regions where it's still volatile and where maybe the political dynamic will be to refuse the right to vote. But again, I've been really now looking at the Somali region, so I cannot tell you uh, about those other regions. But it is something that has to be uh, carefully looked at. I don't see a problem in terms of politics in the Somali region. Again. We have more voting power if we have many voters, uh, but it's the practical issue of, of the ID cards because it's very difficult in their system to have an ID card there re replaced. 
Thanks, uh, Professor. We have a question uh, online, and I have a question myself. Yeah. Yes. Uh, the question is from Dahlia. There are actually two questions. First one is, uh, what are the plans to include communities, displaced and host, in the process more than specifically including members of the community whose voices are not always listened to? The second question is, other than return, voluntarily or not, how are other solutions being developed to take into the account the reality that many displaced people chose not to return? I have two questions based uh, on both countries. Uh, the first one is, it would be good to hear some uh, reflections from you on the role of protection actors and coordination bodies like the cluster in, in these processes. Uh, what could be good for such entities to commit to and be able to rely on in a predictable way uh, in such processes? That's one. The second, um, of course, before uh, before we started this panel, we, we spoke a bit about uh, beyond uh, Ethiopia and Somalia. What would be other opportunities in other countries to, to kick off such processes? Of course, we have places like Afghanistan where, uh, where many elements of, of similar uh, work has been put, uh, but not wrapped together in one go. Uh, so a bit of also reflections of where do you see possible opportunities and how do we how do we take that forward? On community inclusion, that's exactly the idea of community-based planning. And community-based planning is not just the elders. And I think, um, again, with um, the Mignimo project in Somalia, I am Habitat with the RainTech project uh, in Mogadishu, uh, UNDP and uh, UNHCR. We have gained quite a lot of experience on how to really do community-based planning that uh, includes the youth, uh, the women, uh, the marginalized uh, groups. Um, for, uh, and, and this really needs to be implemented. IOM last week did first training of trainers for community-based planning. Um, that's just one little piece, but that's the way to do it, uh, to ensure uh, that um, we, we really have in inclusive processes. Uh, because that's not necessarily the way a top-down country, traditionally top-down country like Ethiopia works. Uh, solutions other than returns. In the Somali region, um, it's very clear. The government uh, has said, yes, those who do not want to return, they um, will be relocated to their sub-clans. Uh, That's the whole relocation process I was talking about. This is not a problem at the level of politics. Uh, the government is totally ready to do that for whatever reasons. If you would do a political uh, economy analysis, probably you would identify some self-interests why these people should be uh, relocated within the Somali uh, region. Um, the big problem is local integration. And local integration, uh, there has been kind of a resistance to that uh, because of, again, the balance uh, between, um, between the different communities. Let's take the Eredava, which is not Somali region, it's one of the city regions. It's Oromos, it's Somalis very very volatile they have a power sharing arrangement one year uh, somali is a mayor and the other is deputy mayor and then it changes again we have there uh, the millennium park site not a good site and um, for instance um, during my last uh, july visit we were discussing with uh, the deputy mayor about uh, rental subsidies and i said no way to do that because the other community immediately would react because it would upset the very fragile balance. So don't import people. So that's a specific um, uh, challenge we have with local integration. And again, from a perspective of peace building, do no harm, we have to take that seriously. And it requires very, very careful uh, analysis, uh, again, of risks of uh, conflict dynamics.
Having said that, there are areas where local integration is possible. And the whole um, menu of options the task force will have to develop in the Somali region is exactly about that, uh, to enlarge uh, kind of yeah, the possibilities. Uh, in other uh, regions, it might be more difficult. And it might require much more time to have that kind of uh, openness uh, at the regional level we, we see in the Somali region. They really say yes, they are different. What we initially want to do, it doesn't work. We, we have to be more nuanced. And again, then uh, for UNHCR, a very important role uh, co chairing uh, the, um, the uh, Oromo Durable Solutions uh, Working Group, um, because their discussions will be probably a bit uh, different. Um, role of protection actions, huge, <laughs> simply because um, returns and relocation of urban solutions in general, there are lots of protection challenges, not the ones you have in an IDP camp. It's not so much about SCBV, these kind of things, uh, uh, recruitment and so on, but for instance, HLP, very high up, voting rights, Documentation, very high up. I am very glad to see that in Ethiopia, the protection cluster included solutions into, uh, the, um, into their protection strategy. And uh, what it requires is um, close uh, interaction with uh, other actors, because this can, I mean, monitoring is important, advocacy is important, but then also to kind of sensitize other actors what the protection challenge could be, how to solve these problems. That's a more operational role that goes beyond the monitoring and the advocacy. But uh, to me, it's, it's very important. And I mean, you, we all remember the discussions like some decades ago, at least those with gray hair, uh, remember those, all the botched relocations done by the World Bank. Hmm? This all, again, from and then the criticism, where are human rights? So uh, here we have a chance. Uh, other countries, I, I don't have really the overview because uh, unlike uh, in my, some of my previous lives, I'm, I'm not uh, looking at all uh, these situations. Uh, but what I heard, um, Sudan might uh, really provide an opportunity because there are discussions about uh, solutions are quite advanced. We have a new government, so Again, we can work because durable solutions only can be achieved if they are government-led. This is about the system. This is about the long term. And um, in the past, we probably didn't have a conducive environment there in Sudan, but that's changing now. And again, it's a new window of opportunity, new people, many technocrats. So again, kind of better way to, to understand the issues. Beyond that, I really would have to scan and um, yeah. I think we're reaching a mature level of, uh, of interaction today. Uh, thank you. By, by way of conclusion, I think what uh, the points I, uh, I detained among others is, is, of course, the importance of looking at these uh, solutions initiatives as creating entry points and that it requires several levels of engagement. I think the illustration of the legal and the policy and the planning and the operational aspects uh, is simple and probably comes natural to you, but I think it's a, it's a good way to structure and illustrate that. And what comes with that is the focus on linking up ministries and private sector and market uh, that, uh, that you, uh, you pointed. I think the idea of a solutions marker in a nexus environment is something that will find traction and another playground to, to sell the idea and push it forward. And maybe with a high level panel of IDPs, that could be a, 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 a pusher uh, to make maybe materialize this. Uh, I think what my major takeaway, I think, is uh, the focus uh, that you've put across all your answers that uh, working on solutions is preventative and not doing it could actually do harm. Uh, and I think that's a bottom line that, uh, that, uh, that we could carry away from this. Uh, so thanks a lot uh, for coming and joining us. Thank you all uh, online and in the room for this. I would like to thank Liz uh, Aster in absentia 
for uh, for organizing this as well as uh, Nancy, Natalie, and Nadine uh, for this. Thanks a lot and have a great day.